our presentation today. We're going to begin by having Dr. Lewis say a few words. Dr. Lewis is on the board for the Humanities Council for the state, and so he'd like to speak to what this means. I, I won't try to use the microphone, and I'll be very brief, but uh, one of the, I guess, more pleasant activities that I've been associated with the last few years is an appointment to the uh, board of directors for the Mississippi Humanities Council. And uh, it's a great group. Uh, some folks are doing some very good work around the state, and uh, it, it, uh, it, it's just been a pleasure to be able to work with them. But one of the things that they ask us to do is to come to these kinds of events which are going on at every college and university all over the state um, during October and November. These faculty lectures and uh, faculty honorees that have been selected uh, to uh, give these lectures and to be the college or university honorees for that particular institution um, and uh, to participate and to welcome the group and just to mention the work of the Humanities Council uh, to the folks so that uh, some recognition is provided to the Humanities Council. Uh, Dr. Jones is this year's honoree um, who has worked hard to prepare this lecture and uh, all will be given a nice stipend uh, from the Humanities Council and will be presented with an award at uh, the statewide recognition ceremony in March, which will be held in Jackson and uh, at that time all the college and university honorees will come together. But I want to thank you on behalf of the Humanities Council for coming and being here and being part of this. And uh, Dr. Young, we'll turn it over to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. has uh, been an instructor here in our music department for many years. She teaches voice, she teaches music appreciation, and she teaches theory lab. I think some of you may experience her classes. She went to Jones. We'll forgive her for that. Um, she then went on to USM, and she has studied vocal performance. But I think one very interesting thing was that she went on to Italy and has a degree from, I'm going to say, a university in Italy. <laughs> I'll let her say the name of it. Uh, in internet, oh, let me make sure I can say that exactly right. She, she holds it in Italian language. Uh, when she came back to the United States, she went to the University of Maryland, where she completed, uh, at the, she was at the acclaimed Maryland Opera Studio Program and received her Doctoral of Musical Arts. Uh, she has many other accomplishments. She performs with the uh, organizations in Hattiesburg. Some of you may have seen her in some of her performances, but I, I wanted to make sure you all knew that she is the Pokemon League leader and former Rome, Italy Pokemon champion. <laughs> so she is a woman of varied interest. <laughs> and I think as you listen to her presentation today, you'll be very impressed with her knowledge and why she came about this knowledge. Thank you very much. Now, I'm deeply honored to be chosen as the Humanities Teacher of the Year here at Pearl River Community College. But five years ago, my son, John Luigi, who's 12 now, would not have agreed with that. He would have been very unhappy if his mom had been chosen of teacher of the, as Teacher of the Year because she didn't act like the Teacher of the Year. So I'd like to show you a scene from my home when John Luigi started taking piano lessons after first grade year in the summer, so we would have plenty of time to practice and learn all the notes. So we began with flashcards. And on the flashcards were notes. So we had to say whether the note was G, F, E, etc. And we had treble clef notes and we had bass clef notes. And I had taught music for a long time and I really thought I knew what I was doing. So I sat there on the bench with John Luigi and I showed him the flash card, and he looked at it. Um, come on, John Luigi, what's the note? G? No, John Luigi, it's not G. Look at it again. What note is it? Um, F? 
No, it's not F, John Luigi. Come on, we have been doing this for weeks. What is it, five or six weeks now? It's going, been going on. We just spent 30 minutes on this one note yesterday. You finally got it. Why can't you remember what the note is? I don't know, Mama. I don't know why I can't remember. Well, just take a look at it again, John Luigi. Here it is. There's the treble clef. There's the bass clef. It's the one in the middle. It's the little one. It's got the little line through it. We talked about this yesterday. What is it, John Luigi? Uh, I don't know. Um, e? No, John Luigi, the note's not E. It's the one in the middle. I don't understand why you can't get it. Why can't you think of it? I mean, why don't you remember what note it is after we've done it day after day? Take a look at it again. Oh, Mom, I just don't know. I know why you don't know, John Luigi. You don't know because you're not trying. Now, why don't you want to learn the notes? Why don't you want to learn music? Why can't you tell me what this note is today? I'm sick and tired of coming in here week after week and spending an hour just trying to do the flashcards because you can't remember from one minute to the next or one day to the next what the note is. So what is the note? She starts banging his head up on the piano. He says, I don't know, Mama. Maybe I'm just dumb. John Luigi wasn't dumb. I was dumb. I was dumb because I was ignorant. And I didn't know that dyslexia could affect his ability to learn music. I have a degree in music education. I had classes in music education. I actually learned what dyslexia was. And I learned that it was a reading disorder. And I knew that John Luigi was dyslexic at that time. He had been diagnosed the year before. But I didn't know that that was what was causing the problem. But I knew that something was wrong. So when John Luigi said to me, maybe I'm just dumb, I knew he wasn't dumb. He had had intelligence tests done the year before. He's highly intelligent. So why can't a highly intelligent person remember from one day to the next what middle C is? When I'm saying it's the one in the middle. It's just not clicking. Why can't he get it? So I knew right then and there I needed to do some research. I needed to find out what was happening and why my son couldn't grasp this. So I went to the library and I got some books and I opened the first one and I'm not kidding. It said, never tell a dyslexic child that they're not trying. I've already broken all the rules. I've yelled at him. I've lowered his self-esteem. I've told him he's not trying. And remember what his response was to me? Mama, I'm trying as hard as I can. So let me tell you what I found out about dyslexics so that you won't make the same mistake I've made. I found out from the National Institutes of Health that dys dyslexia is a learning disorder. It affects one in five people. So on your handout that I gave to you, there's a number at the top. And if you have number one, would you raise your hand, please? So if you have number one, would you please stand so we can see what one in five looks like in a group. So in an ordinary classroom setting, you think about how many students have dyslexia. Thank you. You may sit down. And unfortunately, many people with dyslexia go undiagnosed. They suffer from low self-esteem. They can't manage their schoolwork. So and when they get to high school, they drop out. And some of them end up in prison. The studies show that the prisons are full of people with dyslexia because they just couldn't overcome these difficulties that they had. I found out that dyslexia is hereditary. I always blame my husband's side of the family on that one. <laughs> I found out that it is a learning disability that affects a person's ability to read. But under that same definition, it also says it affects their ability to write, to spell, 
and sometimes to do arithmetic. I found that there are many other symptoms from the International Dyslexic Association, page after page of symptoms. Did you know that dyslexics have trouble learning to tie their shoes? So if kindergarten teachers knew the children that couldn't tie their shoes, they could be alert to notice if they were having trouble in their reading. My son is 12 years old now. We've taught him to tie his shoes many, 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 many times. And he would always forget the next day or five minutes later because they can't remember a sequence of events, a sequence in procedures. So he just learned to tie his shoes this summer before he started sixth grade, and he's 12 years old, and we're very proud of him for doing that. So the dyslexics have many problems. So today I'm going to show you how those symptoms can appear also in music. So let's take reading. I was right when I used to think that d dyslexics saw letters in reversal, right? A B would be a D, for example. Or they might see the word was, W-A-S, might be saw. Well, really, they don't see it backwards, but once they take in the information, the brain has trouble processing that information. So dyslexics can be of high intelligence, but their brain actually thinks differently than ours. The problem is that teachers try to teach everybody the same way, and they don't adapt to different learning styles. So it's true that they might see letters in reversal, or uh, guess, they might guess at words just by the shape of the word. So you have a dyslexia simulation in front of you, a little handout that I gave you. It says, this simulation demonstrates some common symptoms of dyslexia. Read the paragraph aloud. The letters may be reversed, inverted, transposed, and the spelling is inconsistent. Now, Mr. Flynn has not looked at his, and he is going to stand up and try to read this for us. But I want you to imagine how the dyslexic child in a classroom feels if they struggle with reading and their teacher calls on them to read aloud. Now, imagine every time he pauses, we snickered, or we muttered under our breath, dummy. Or we said to him, how did he ever get in this classroom with all us smart people, right? So Mr. Flynn is going to give it a try. Would a text-only site be ideal for someone with a reading disorder? Hardly. Images are not bad for accessibility. They actually increase comprehension and for most audiences. <laughs> Usability. <laughs> uh, what many people do not know, though, it, it is there is much more at the accessibility for an image than just its text. Some people roughly assume that images are bad for accessibility, since all text essentially replaces the image with a text-only version of that image. Is that somebody's name? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> by Colonel Blah Blah. Paul. <laughs> by Paul Boyman. So the letters can be upside down, reversed, etc. So their brains, according to University of Washington study, work five times harder than our brains to process information. So when they're learning to read, another thing that they lack is phonemic awareness. They don't know that the, the sounds k, a, t, make the sound word cat. They just know the sound cat is the word. They don't hear that it is made up of different sounds. Musicians, you can understand with chords, it would be hard for them to think of the chord being made up of different notes. So 
it's very difficult for them to learn what the sounds make. And then when they do start reading, they have to sound out a lot of words. And I'll give you an example of my son trying to sound out the word basket when he was in the first grade. So he comes to the word basket, and he starts to sound it out, and it's really hard to remember what the sounds are. B. Basket, John Luigi. It's basket. Okay, basket. Two lines later, there's a basket again. If we start again, he doesn't remember. How can you not remember, John Luigi? We just sounded it out. It took us five minutes to sound it out. Here we are again with basket. Okay, but I didn't tell him. I let him sound it out. B, A, S, K. Right. So we went through all of that again for him to be able to sound out that word. And I read in the studies that it takes between 500 and 1,500 repetitions of a word before it becomes part of their long-term memory. So every time he saw a was and he said was after he sounded it, and every time he saw basket he had to sound it out again because he hadn't gotten to 500 times yet. So whenever I worked with John Luigi with the flashcards on the notes, Guess how many repetitions it took to learn what those note names were. And what's amazing, because the, their brains are so remarkable, is that he knew when he looked at a, a note on a flash card to play a certain note. He knew if he looked at a G to play this note. But if you ask him to recall it, he couldn't say it. So it wasn't a problem not understanding, he just couldn't get it out. So he knew to press the D, but don't ask him to say it. And on top of that, his teacher asked him to do this with flashcards. Now, dyslexic symptoms are worse when they're under stress. And timing someone causes stress. It's worse when they're tired, worse when they're sick. So the minute the teacher asks the student to respond with flashcards, they're more stressed, and now they're really not going to be able to think about it, right? So you wanted to be able to do all those flashcards in one minute more stress, so it even takes longer. <coughs> now he does know his names of his notes. He's been taking piano five years, but sometimes still in the music I can say, well, what note is that? And he'll just play it, and I just leave him alone, because I know at that moment he can't pull that up. So that's how it affects us in reading music. And there's so much entailed in music. We have the note names, we have rhythms, and we have foreign language words. Allegro, andante, da capo, crescendo, decrescendo, right? All these foreign language words. And if it's hard to learn one language, imagine how difficult it is to learn a foreign language for them. So it's just complicated on top of that. If you're a choir director, imagine how hard it is for the person to read the music and read the words at the same time as they sing and try to get all of that out. I'm going to go on to the next thing that dyslexics have difficulty with, and that is writing. Many of them will hold their pencils funny. Wish I had one today. All kind of contortions that they'll make. It's another way that uh, first grade, second grade teachers can notice if somebody might have dyslexia because they do tend to hold the pencils in a strange way. And their handwriting can be extremely messy, not uh, legible even. And so if we ask a student on a theory test to write in all their sharps and flats, they can't space them equally, and it's really difficult for them to get them on the lines and get notes in the right space and in the light on that little staff. So you might blow the staff up, make it larger, to make it easier for them to write that down. It's very difficult, or when you can let them use the computer. My son um, took a test, theory test, as part of a piano competition. And he struggled with writing. But we worked really hard. We took lots of practice tests. And he went in to take the test, and he had to identify the notes. And he wrote the B's and the D's backwards. And they counted off. So his teacher said to the head of the competition, you know, John Luigi has dyslexia, he has a learning disability, 
would you please let him just give you the answers orally because we know without a shadow of a doubt that he knows which is which. He knows which is a B and which is a D. Please give, this, give him the courtesy, this accommodation to do this. Because if he didn't do it, it meant he couldn't move on to the state level of the competition. And guess what? The head of the director or the head of the competition said to him, if your son has a disability, maybe he needs to enter the Special Olympics and not our piano competition. Let's go to the next area, spelling. They have trouble remembering the order of things. So remembering the order of the letters in a word is very difficult. For us in music, spelling is maybe learning the um, notes in a triad, in a major triad, in a minor triad, learning scales. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. So that is a great problem for them as well with spelling. I told my son's second grade teacher, we're not studying for any more spelling tests. Because hour after hour, every day, we would study the spelling words, and he would go in on Friday to take the spelling test, and it would still fail. And he might know the words on Thursday night. He might even know the words on Friday morning before he left for school. But there was no guarantee when he took that test that he was going to know the words. And so I found, after I did a trial on this, that there was no difference between when we studied for the test and when we didn't study for the test. The grades were all the same anyway. And that gradually, with enough repetition, he would do better. And he does now. So he usually makes high Bs or As in spelling, just because it's gradually getting into his long-term memory. Another thing that affects the dyslexia is arithmetic. In music, we have counting. That's our arithmetic, figuring out rhythms. It's extremely difficult for them to play and count at the same time. Dyslexics in math will reverse numbers. 41 becomes 14. They have trouble remembering the steps in a sequence, they, so they can't do long division. They have trouble memorizing, so they can't memorize their multiplication tables. They have trouble walking in time to the music, moving to the music. Another one of John Luigi's music teacher asked them to walk around the room, moving to the music, move in time with the music. And I knew that John Luigi couldn't do this because I tried to use this to help him at home. And so he's just moving and having a good time, moving and what he thinks is to the beat. And the teacher said, John Luigi, you're just goofing off. Go over there and sit and time out. And so he says, no, I really am trying to walk in time. Why am I in trouble? And she says, it's hard to believe both your parents are musicians. Like, because you can't even walk in time. How could both of your parents be musicians? So they do have a lot of trouble with arithmetic, and that does hurt them in their mathematics as well. There are so many other symptoms that I could get into with how it affects these students. But, so I have prepared a handout with symptoms of dyslexia so that if you would like to know more about this, you would be able to pick this up on the way out. But I want to end today by telling you the strengths of dyslexics. Dyslexics have remarkable brains. The studies show that the right side of their brain is actually larger than the average person's right side of their brain. So they tend to be very creative, they're very curious, and they think outside the box. I read a recent study that said one in three millionaire entrepreneurs in America is dyslexic because they're capable of so much. But we have to be able to be flexible in our teaching approach to help them. We have to understand what the symptoms are so that we don't accuse them of being lazy or being dumb or just not trying. So today I would like to end with a video entitled The Power of Dyslexia. It's about famous dyslexics who have had someone there to support them to help them to achieve great things. So we're going to end with this. I thank you so much for coming. And after the video, I'll be happy to answer any of your questions.
Thank you so much for coming. Are there any questions? Yes, sir. Is, are there any studies uh, based on the visual aspect of it? How much of this is visual? You know what I mean? Okay. Dyslexics have a remarkable way of seeing. They see in 3D. So when they look at a musical staff, the notes and the uh, clefts can be floating around as if you can see it through it and at all angles. And their brains are extremely visual. Steven Spielberg, for example, has dyslexia. And they see movies in their mind. So they know now that the problem is not that they're, with their vision, they see just fine. It's what happens once that information goes into the brain with processing. And there's actually a gene um, for, for, that is responsible for the dyslexia and that they know which part of the brain it affects. So it is not a problem with vision. On the contrary, they actually have incredible ways of seeing. When John Luigi was three years old, Trevor, he was playing in his room one day and he got extremely frustrated with something. He says, that movie just isn't right. I'm like, whoa. What, what do you mean the movie's not right? He said, well, I want Teddy to be wearing the red shirt, but he keeps coming back in the blue shirt. So I'll look at the TV and I said, but John Luigi, the TV's not on. What are you talking about? He said, no, not a movie on TV. You know, the one that goes in your head. The movies that play in your head. You have movies in your head? Yeah, you know, and I want Teddy to be wearing his red shirt, but he's still wearing the blue shirt. So he's not seeing it in his mind the way he wanted to see it. So they see in home movies. Not all. Depends on the nature because all dyslexics are slightly different. They're all unique, like a fingerprint. Yes? Do colors affect the way you perceive them? It helps to use colors. And in fact, if you want a handout, I have some very good suggestions for that. Sometimes when uh, things are printed on white paper, there's too much of a glare. It makes them difficult to see. So if you could photocopy it onto a pale yellow or pale pink, even you could try any color but those. I, I've had experience with those, and I know that they work pretty well. And some teachers actually use transparencies, overlays, on top of the, uh, whatever they're reading to help them to be able to see them. But again, it depends on the nature of their vision. And there's a particular name for that problem where they have trouble with light sensitivity in that. That's a very good question, though. That's something you could always try. Yes? I know you've told me that he um, memorizes his they do it a lot by feel and by his ear, but it depends on the person. But another thing that I've discovered is it's very important when you're working with someone with dyslexia to set small goals, work in small chunks. You can't give them too much to do. And I use this technique even with all of my students when I give them something to memorize. My voice students will know, I, I would rarely say to you, memorize this whole song by next week because I know it won't happen because there's a process that they need to go through and I've learned that process from working with John Luigi. So we usually memorize one phrase, okay? And then we reinforce that and reinforce that. Then we add another phrase. And so we really start to know it physically, what it feels like and what it sounds like to him. I think my husband would agree on that. So that if I know he has to have a piece memorized by a certain date, we start gradually. And I do the same thing with my voice students. So I say, this is recital class. We have four weeks. By next week, you need to have, depending on the length of the song, one page. But that one page may only have two or three phrases. And then I'll say to them, now during the week, instead of memorizing the whole page the night before you come in for your lesson, I want you to memorize line one on tonight. To do it 25 times. Tomorrow, I want you to do line two 25 times, add line one to it, and then add line three. And so they learn, and they're able to memorize their music on schedule.